The first order of business is the um, approval of the minutes from the October meeting. I have one item when you're ready. Um, under conditional use permits, the, the last paragraph you refer to uh, the October meeting. I think it should be November. Any other comments? I have a clarification under, under C2. Um, <clears throat> under, note that there is apparent soil movement from, this should be added to it just for clarification, a known area with invasives to a site on Copper Road, because it was a little unclear if you hadn't known the history. <clears throat> Any other comments? Some high motion. I make a motion to accept the minutes as amended and corrected. Okay, there's a motion and a second to accept the minutes as amended. Mr. Rose, are you ready? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? I'm gonna abstain. Abstain. Yeah. Okay. Uh, minutes are approved. Um, public comment. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak? Okay. Seeing no one, uh, we'll move on to item three, conditional use permits. Michael Davis is seeking a conditional use permit for the after the fact, excuse me, excavation and alter, alterations within the wetland and repairing wetland buffer on a property located at 25 Otis Road in the residential single family R1 district, assessor's map 31, lot 49, CUP 3, 2023. And I think Mr. Davis is here. Would you come up, please? I don't know if the mic is on, but if, the, if it is, the green light will be on. It's the gray button, you get that? Sorry, that's all the time we have left. <laughs> <laughs> Would you just state your name and your address, please? I'm Mike Davis, 25 Otis Road, Summersworth. All right, thank you for coming. Um, I see your timeline. And um, has the rest of the commission had a chance to look at it? Rough version, yeah, but. So when we left off at the last meeting, we had asked for some sort of timeline so that we could um, determine what work was, was done when and, and how that applied to whatever um, ordinance was in, in effect at the time. Okay. Um, and we wanted to gauge that before visiting the site, which I think is the next step. I assume people are going to have some questions, comments. I had a couple of questions. Um, one is, which direction does the um, water in the culvert flow? Does it flow from the pond to the wetlands or from the wetlands to the pond? Pond to the wetlands. Okay. Is there any kind of um, 
mitigation at the end of it, any riprap or any way to prevent it from being a problem in the wetlands? There's four inch, four, six inch riprap at the end. At the end of the pond? At the end of the culvert on the, on the edge of my property. So before it exits your property? Yes. There's no inlet to your spring fed. So I noticed that you, you said that you'd put the culvert in. Um, I also wanted to clarify, it looks like from aerial photos that um, the stream was filled itself, the whole stream. The, uh, the ravine was, yes. I basically laid the culvert in and just put dirt over the top of it. What? So I didn't change no heights or anything. It's right, but the culvert is, um, Just a portion of the length of the of the stream that's on your property, right? It, now it goes to, from the right from the pond to the edge of my property. Yeah, it was two. Um, it was two phases, right? Two phases. Yeah. yeah. The one in blue and the one in, in yellow, yellow or something. In. So the the first phase was the blue. Uh, yes, I think. Yeah, the short piece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the yellow is, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the filling. Of the the outlet stream. Yeah, in the beginning, I put the, the first piece in so I could actually get to the other side of my property, because the swale went from the pond to the property's edge. So I put the first piece in so I could get across to actually utilize the rest of the property, and then I ended up putting the whole piece in later down the road, as it states. Okay, so the culvert was for for crossing the the stream. Yes. And then filling it, what was that for? <coughs> when I did the whole thing, I just, I just wanted to make a nice flat level field out there. It was my whole intention to, just to utilize it, make it look better, and you know, just a nice backyard. That's kind of where this whole ordeal started. Okay. If, if you guys take a walk through, you'll <coughs> you'll see where my intentions were or are. I mean, so essentially, you have. Put in a hundred and I don't know, 175 feet. The 20 up. foot is uh, something like that. 140. Yeah, so you had a stream bed. Yeah, it's and just, you know, it's just a swale. Sure, yep. it, you put in those pipes at the different times, connected them, and, and filled it. Just filled it over the yeah. top. Okay. Yep. So there's no outflow from the pond right now? Out, just that, that one culvert. You said outflow, correct? Right. Yeah. Well, no, it's not even, it's below the, the bottom of the culvert right now, so there's nothing coming out. It stays pretty much at, at a, it maintains a level. So does this yellow line represent a pipe that was then covered, or is it just filled? It was a swale. Mm -hmm. Pipe was set in the bottom. There, it was put over the top. Okay. I didn't change no elevations. I didn't do anything except for just set the pipe in and put dirt over the top of it. Okay. What diameter is the pipe? Twelve inch. <coughs> I think I saw on that timeline somewhere. Okay. And do you know? I mean, this may be stepping back a little bit, but so the pond was dug over some years by the previous owner yeah, Mr. Jackson you guys took over the property so did he also dig that channel I assume so so yeah okay so you, you think yeah, it I was did. dug but you don't know yeah that was all in place well if I go back to the uh, 1962 aerial photo there's something there there's a pond there it may have been okay expanded yeah yeah okay I don't know exactly when he dug it I uh, he bought it in 58, so I assume sometime in the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know exactly when it was built, but I assume the 60s at some point. Okay. And then when, when you took over the property, did you enlarge the pond? No. No. So the footprint's the same as what when yes. you arrived on the thing? <coughs> Do 
Do you, and you, I apologize if you went over this before our last meeting, but that was a while ago now. Um, what did you do in the disturb? So you have the 50 foot uh, wetland setback, the, the 100 foot buffer. What have you done in those areas? I mean, so you have it listed here as disturbed, which your, your figure's helpful, but have you done any type of planting or anything in there at all? Is it no. just, it was That's disturbed much left? the grade it was. All I did was, mm -hmm. most, of the, most of the amount of material was outside of that 100 foot setback, 99.5% mm -hmm. of it. <laughs> um, the only reason I put disturbed up right to the pond, I put six inches of loam down <coughs> uh, over the whole area mm -hmm. and seeded it, hydro seeded it, and you know, I'm now mowing it and it looks beautiful. Right, so okay, so you have planted it essentially. Oh, gra oh grass seed, yes, no, no actual plants. Now, it, I'm sure it does look beautiful. Um, unfortunately, that's not in keeping with the, the ordinance. So I don't want to get your hopes up from when we visit there, but it, we're probably not going to um, just say that it's okay and you can leave it like that. Okay. I just wanted to let you know up front. I just want to get this resolved and put it to bed. So I'm up for, you know. To a certain point, I'm up to for doing whatever. I just want okay. to put this to bed. Been dragging on and on and on. It just needs to sure. be done. So, you know, whatever suggestions you guys have, or is, uh, I'm sure you're going to put a plan together of some sort for me. Yeah, we'll we'll probably have to see it first. Yep, that's fine. Remind me again what the black borders indicate on the plan. Um, it says on the Better. That's a disturbed area, I believe. So all this stuff, even the zero to fifty foot, is disturbed. It's grassy. I said so most it's of disturbed. that. It's just not what was there originally. It's. It was. It, it pretty much is just the way it was. So it looks like I think what she's asking is there's black marker. It looks like. Yeah. On the right hand side of the um, the pipe. Is that significant? Does that mean? <laughs> does that mean something? It's in here somewhere. So, um, to clarify, when you say disturbed, you mean filled or, or graded, right? Graded. As opposed to grass. There, there were also <laughs> trees cut. I put some loam down. You know, it might have been like bumpy, and I just kind of like graded it out. Yeah. You know, that's still disturbed, and according to the rules, so it's not a, it's not a real big area. Well, first talking about. there were trees cut, and then the loam was put down, right? Uh, the trees were cut a long, long, long ago. Um, not that long ago, according to the Just 2007. Photos. I bought it in six. I had a, this company came in and did it, actually. I went to work and came home, and the place had been pretty much clear cut. Um, but it was your, I mean, you owned it at that point. I owned it, yeah. 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 I didn't realize that. That's kind of not really what, I didn't highlight any of that because it wasn't really what we're here for, I don't think. As far uh, as those go, yeah, that hasn't ever been mentioned. So I, yeah, way back it, it, it got cut, and I went in. I took all the stumps out. That was way back in 2006, seven, and then it sat, and then we said all of this started. So yeah, it looks like 2007, and then additional cutting at some time after that, further from the pond. The, the timeline that I have in front of me indicates that. In November 20, 2008, um, there was some, you did some cutting. At that point, that was okay because the wet, the um, wetlands riparian buffer ordinance hadn't happened. But in December, it had happened. In 2008. 2000 November of 2008 hadn't been adopted yet. 
There was a, there was an ordinance in place. Um, not the particular ordinance that we have ordinance that we have now. Right, it was rewritten, but there's still a right. 50 foot and 100 foot buffer at okay. that time. In that case, so then at that point it was, but that was when you did the initial timber cutting according to this. Then you did some more in 2010, um, <coughs> according to the complaint that was lodged, um, and that was in September. Um, so it looks like it's been more uh, more ongoing and more recent than what you stated just Six, now. Six, seven, eight, somewhere there. <coughs> it all the big. The 10, 2010, there was probably four pine trees on top of this mountain of dirt. That's the, the big tree work that I did. You know, and you also moved some, removed some stumps, which makes the um, soil um, I removed the whole pile, so. more problematic as far as keeping it in place and stuff like that because the, the stumps kind of hold it in place. Yep. Um, so there still was a lot of work that was done <coughs> from what I'm seeing. <coughs> and I just wanted to bring that for that issue forward. Well, there was a whole pile of gravel there that's been moved. Pardon? There's, there's a whole pile of gravel and rocks. That have been. Matter of fact, when you look them over, look, you're going to still see enough boulders to easily fill this room. Yeah, the, the pile of gravel and rocks <laughs> was outside the buffer, so that's... Trying to get rid of <laughs> ...doesn't come into play here. Okay. So what we're doing is, is just gathering facts, and then when we get to the site, we can, you know, hopefully clarify some more of this, and then have a follow-up meeting um, okay. and, and vote on it. Yeah. Because, um, you know, we're not... We're not going to be asking you a lot of timeline questions and, and that sort of thing on site. Right? We just want to see it. Yeah. Probably ask you some questions, but we want to gather information up front. I can show you way better too when we're standing out there exactly where stuff was and is, and how, you know, mm -hmm. you'll see how it is now. But I can say this is what was here. This is what I'm actually talking about, and here's the remnants. And you can move around the rest of right. the yard. I built retaining walls and to try and use some of the rocks. So I got <coughs> a lot of retaining walls all over the place. Um, and you'll still see the piles of rocks that are there, um, which is a considerable amount. Okay. Um, does anybody have any other questions before we talk about a site walk? I just have a question on the <coughs> Uh, the 50 foot sec back, it looks like there's a stone wall on the edge of the pond. Is that something that was there or something that you built? That I put in there. You put that in? Yeah, yeah. it was like washing out. So I did it for stabilization and also aesthetics, but mostly for the stabilization. Okay, but that was in the 50 foot Yeah, buffer. that was right on, the, right on the edge of the bank. And yeah. It was more structural than it was yeah. visible. And a lot of animals, because it goes down to the water, a lot of the smaller fish and, and the frogs and everything are thriving in there. It's all grown back in now. <laughs> it's all got, um, you know, lily pads and you name it. So. Collins, any questions? Mr. Rhodes? Are we ready to schedule a visit? Sure. Would um, the city be able to attend? Depending on when it is, most likely. Willing, I should say. Yes. Okay, so we're at November 6th. Uh, eighth, sorry. Um, you've got a planning meeting on the 15th, right? Correct, at 6.30. Why, uh, why don't we cater to you then? What, what days I don't attend to planning board FY anymore. Okay. What, what days of the week are good for you? 
I am flexible just with enough notice um, prior for my kids. So um, it would be what's best for the commission, I would say. All right. The only date I can't do it is the 16th. Um, do you want to try for next week? Are we looking at during the day? Um, because it's going to get dark around 4. Yeah, it's going to be before 5. Is there any chance? I'm working at Wolf Row right now. I'm doing long days. Mm -hmm. Like a six, after the 16th. I don't know, it was the A, so next week, the following week, not this. So you could do it during the day, the week of the 20th? Yep, that'd be fine. That's easier for you? Yeah, please. Either first thing in the morning or um, I'm usually home by 3, 3.30. Um, if that, or whenever you, whenever you guys get there. So Thanksgiving is on the 23rd. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I'm busy on the 20th, so Tuesday or Wednesday work for anybody? I could do those. I, I think we, we definitely would want to meet by three. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just tell me what time I'll be there. Okay. <coughs> I could do Tuesday and Wednesday of that week, either one of those days. Hmm. I'll be here anyways. <laughs> So, um, what about three o'clock on the twenty-first? Yeah, that sounds good. All right. Thank you, and uh, we'll see you then. If awesome. anything yeah. comes up, let us know, and I think we'll, we'll be good. We'll do likewise. Awesome. Have All a right. night, guys. Thank you. Do you, you want a motion to schedule that? Yes, and, we do need a motion. Um, continue. It. You're set, Mike. It's just formalities. Thank you. Yeah. Um, does anybody have a motion? to continue and to schedule the site yeah. visit. Okay. I'll second. All right, there's a motion and a second. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Site walk is scheduled. Three o'clock. New business, item four, Summersworth uh, tr City Tree Survey, Elizabeth Durfee, Design and Planning, LLC. Would you please come up and share your wisdom? Um, I have a couple of slides. Can I hook up to this? Okay. And will you be able to see them? I'll, I'll just move. following their completion of the project, so I thought it'd be helpful to share that. <coughs> While we're getting that started, I have a couple of things that I just want to know. Um, one, I think about one copy of the instructions that we handed out, and then ten copies of the Thank you. Can I use this one if I'm standing here? Okay. I'm trying to remember the one. Okay.
All right, so um, good evening, everyone. My name is Liz Durfee. I'm an independent planning consultant, and I worked on a street tree inventory with the city of Dover um, as a subcontractor to the Stratford Regional Planning Commission a couple years ago, and um, Doug reached out to me to um, see if I could come in and talk to the commission to hear a little bit more about what Dover did. Um, so this is sort of a short version of some of the information that I presented to Dover's Conservation Commission uh, and their, actually their Forest um, Stewardship Committee following that project. Um, so I've cut out a couple of the portions that I didn't think were um, quite as relevant to what I think you're looking for, um, but feel free to interrupt and ask questions and let me know if I need to be louder, et cetera. So the street tree plan that um, I worked on with Stratford Regional Planning Commission in Dover was part of a larger effort um, that the Stratford Regional Planning Commission um, worked on. They applied for funding through the New Hampshire Coastal Program and received some uh, grant funds to do um, a few different pieces of a project looking at some resilience building measures and also some stormwater management pieces. And a part of that project was to conduct a street tree inventory and develop a street tree plan to help um, manage the, uh, the trees in the central business <laughs> district, which is sort of the, the core downtown area in Dover. Um, so my portion of the project, I had worked on a street tree inventory, I think it was maybe in 2008, but I did used to work for Stratford Regional Planning Commission and they knew I um, you know, had that somewhat limited experience and interest. And so they reached out to me to see if I wanted to support this project. And I worked primarily with SRPC's GIS planner, Jackson Rand. Um, who did, uh, who managed um, the, um, the app that I'll tell you about that we used and produced most of the maps for the, for the project. Um, so these bullets here kind of outline the main pieces of the inventory process. First, what we did was think about what attributes we wanted to collect, what questions did we want to ask people during the survey. And I looked through quite a few different plans um, and inventories from other areas of the country. There's not, um, I didn't find any um, very comprehensive examples from New Hampshire. I know Concord did a survey in, in the past, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't very detailed. Um, and we met with staff um, from a few different departments and brainstormed what, what information did the city want, how do they want to use the information, um, what's reasonable for people to collect in, a, in a, a survey, and compiled that into a spreadsheet and um, developed some instructions for volunteers. This was 2020, so we weren't even meeting in person to do any trainings at that point. So I put together the packet that I printed out, and um, you can find all of the information, I think, on Dover's website, the full plan and all the appendices. Um, and I'd be happy to send a link over for that if you're interested in, in diving into that. But I put together this packet of instructions um, with the hope that it could be used again in other areas of Dover or other communities. Um, we recruited some volunteers through the, the Forest Stewardship Subcommittee, the Conservation Commission, and then also through Nature Groupie, which is uh, an organization that um, helps pair um, other organizations and volunteers with volunteer opportunities um, and projects and efforts that could use volunteers doing a whole host of um, mostly outdoor activities. Um, so I did connect with a couple more Dover residents through Nature Groupie, which was great. Um, I mostly coordinated over the phone and over email with the volunteers, and, um, and we worked to troubleshoot a few issues with the survey, but for the most part, um, the, um, the app that we used, which is called Survey123, um, it's through Esri, which is this standard ArcGIS mapping software. 
Um, that worked really well, I thought. And we also created the paper copies that I've handed out um, just for a few folks didn't want to use the app. Some people just couldn't get it to work on their phones. And so we had a, a few individuals um, use one of those forms for each tree that they visited. So we assigned streets to um, the volunteers, depending on how much time they wanted to spend, um, where they lived, if they happened to live nearby. And Jackson sent out a couple maps with the area to them, um, and we sent them on their way. And most folks used the Survey123 app, which didn't require a login for them. Jackson managed, um, managed the app uh, survey form um, at SRPC, and and then the data trickled in. What's nice about Survey One Two Three is that it allowed people to walk up to a tree, um, drop a pin, which was I, I think it has like a five meter accuracy, um, which is pretty accurate, um, and then also take pictures and upload it through the app. So some of the questions that we asked are related to maintenance needs, for example or if, you know, is there even a tree in this pit, for example. So it was great to collect the photos that way. And then um, we, here's a screenshot um, for anyone who's watching at home of the form that has the, the questions uh, that we asked. I think the order of the questions was slightly different in the app itself. Um, but we pointed people, we didn't do a lot of hands-on tra training uh, or tree identification training. Um, a lot of our volunteers were generally familiar with different species. I'm not an arborist myself, but you know, generally familiar with some species. And we pointed people towards different apps that are out there to help um, with identification. And this is some of the data that we collected. Um, so uh, all the data came in through the app and then we manually entered, I don't know, probably about 20 different trees from the paper forms and um, looked at uh, 378 sites and found nine stumps, three dead trees, um, eight empty pits and some of the basic statistics were the, um, <coughs> the average diameter breast height um, or the median diameter breast height, uh, the average height of the trees. We pointed people towards uh, a YouTube video that shows how you can measure trees with a, like, with a stick, basically, um, and the average tree pit size. We didn't do a lot of QA, QC of the data because this was a pretty expedited, low relatively low budget process, so we relied heavily on the data that came in. Um, there were a couple species that we said, well, those, we've never heard of those. Um, they're only found in Africa, so we know that's not right, and so I went out and looked at a couple spots. Jackson did a little tweaking with the actual points to line them up a little bit where they weren't totally lined up on the streets themselves, but for the most part, this we're relying on the information that, that came in. Um, from the volunteers did you have any did you have any situations where you could because the app allows you to take those pictures and upload them where you could have like was there anybody in place to you know give a yay or nay to the tree species or we did try like to that? do that when we were um, one of the streets um, Silver Street Street has a specific planting guide and planting guidelines and so we knew generally like which species were there. Um, so when other species popped up or for example, when, when trees that we just didn't see anywhere else popped up, we could try to look on the, the images that came in and see if we could identify from those images, which they, you know, save time from having sure. to go out there. Yeah, so. and so did you ask each volunteer uh, to, to like take a picture of the, if they could, of the crown or of the leaf or of the bark and yeah, submit those. Um, wh what did we ask? I think we asked for a, a shot of like the whole tree and then any ma specific maintenance needs. Yep. So okay. if there was like a sidewalk heaving up or overhead wires, that sort of thing, we got, um, we got photos of those too. All right, thanks. Um, these are the species that were found through the survey. Um, 
a lot of lin linden, um, a lot of Norma maple, and then they do have quite a few green ash that weren't in um, great health. So that, that'll come up in a couple slides. Um, then we had, you know, all this data is, is in GIS too, so it's really easy to map some of the different attributes. Um, and um, we asked a number of maintenance questions that you can see on that form, and then we asked for an overall general rating um, and described what we meant by good or fair. Um, and so this is the results of, of that question. And then you can see the corresponding colors in the dots of the different locations. Um, and then we looked at the condition um, by species to see if there were any particular species that really didn't seem to be thriving. And then the maintenance issues. It was a dry summer, and so a, a lot of the trees needed water, um, mulch, pruning. <coughs> a lot of them had overhead wires. Um, we asked about vandalism. I think that was something that the city wanted to know about and really didn't um, find much of that at all, which was nice. Um, I th we didn't find a lot of disease or, or pest damage evident, but I also am not confident that um, myself included knew you know, exactly what we were looking for when we were looking for um, you know, evidence of, of past pest damage. So. And then we had some photos of some of the maintenance needs. So in the, the plant, the street tree plant itself has a, a kind of a lot of information. One of the things the city wanted to do was really connect back to um, what some of the benefits are of street trees for the community, for um, you know, increasing climate resilience. So there's that sort of background information um, in, in the plan to um, sort of help justify why there are trees and why it's important to maintain them. Um, that was something that, that city staff were interested in. Um, there, there's sort of a real cursory review of some of the existing regulations um, related to planting, such as in the site plan regs and other, um, other regulations. Um, that the city has on the books, just as a sort of a flag of, you know, if if you're making any updates or recommendations, they have, I think, three different lists of species to plant in different places. So if they do go through the process of, you know, revamping their planting list, these are the areas that you, you know, may need to adjust in your regulations. Um, some really rough Siting and planting guidelines, you'll see one of the questions is, is there four feet of space between a building and a tree pit for uh, accessibility? Um, and, um, and then a suggested annual maintenance schedule. This is just a screenshot. <clears throat> um, there will be no quiz on this after. Um, obviously can't read it, of, of uh, the um, recommended species, so we pulled out some of the species that seem to be doing better health-wise, um, uh, that aren't, um, you know, that maybe provide a, a little bit more um, benefit in terms of habitat than um, Norway maples or lindens that are kind of overused in a lot of the urban streetscapes, and um, included a couple um, columns to show are they included on. So one of the lists is the accessible street trees for Dover, um, the Silver Street planting list, the downtown Dover pedestrian and vehicular access streetscape study, um, and then included the, um, the estimated percent of the trees that they account for of all the ones that we inventoried, and then their average health condition. Uh, and then we have sort of some um, low-hanging fruit action steps um, for replacing trees in the empty street tree pits and some maps that are associated with that, um, removing the stumps and replacing trees in existing tree pits where there are stumps, 
um, removing the dead or the dying trees and replacing those, removing the ash trees um, and treating with an insecticide. Um, and this is that's something that we talked to um, some folks at uh, Cooperative Extension about. Um, and then establishing new tree pits in areas with lower street tree density. And so this was just a density map that we put together to show where there are m more and less trees. And, and obviously in the areas that don't have, we're only looking at street trees, so the trees that are in the sidewalks, um, so th some areas are parks, those don't show up on here. Um, and just some general recommendations on um, you know, what could be what size and spacing in, in some of those areas of the downtown. Um, <clears throat> again, we wanted to highlight that the GIS database that the city now has can be used to identify <coughs> those trees and actually go out um, without having to search for them. And then some general management um, recommendations and really ballpark estimated cost which probably isn't accurate three years later um, for, for the city. And this was based on kind of issues that the staff were specifically kind of interested in, um, in tackling. When you say the staff, was there um, a department that was driving this project that required the data or this grow up out of the <laughs> Uh, Conservation Commission itself or so um, this came out of the forest uh, this actually I think was initiated by Stratford Regional Planning Commission um, the um, community services um, was a department that we worked with most um, with Gretchen Young um, and we also um, she coordinated with um, I think it's facilities services, I want to say. And I'd have to double check on what the department, the, the folks who actually would be going out and doing the work. Mm -hmm. um, Gretchen was a big part of the project because there were um, other stormwater management pieces. So she was our primary contact there. Um, Did they have um, a mission to care for the trees or um, something to that effect? Was there? Um, you know, was there a, a city requirement that led to this or? Well, one of the things that is in the kind of the beginning introduction of the plan itself is um, a connection to pieces of their different master plan chapters that point towards resilience measures and point towards um, um, livability and and things related to street trees. Um, so, in order to meet those uh, master plan uh, <coughs> criteria, then this tool enables that. Is that basically what? Yeah, I mean, I I would probably defer to city staff for that question specifically. Um, and maybe Stratford Regional Planning Commission may have a little bit more insight um, as to sort of the early discussions behind why are they choosing a street tree inventory as a piece of this resilience project. Mm -hmm. um, it, it makes sense to us. It's just, yeah. um, it's helpful to know what Dover's thinking, you know, thought process was to, to get to it. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a genuine interest in, I mean, you can, you can see driving down 108, the, all the ash trees are basically right over the cars and dying. And I think there's an interest in um, sort of across the board resilience measures in the city. Um, I know that's quite important to, um, to the community based on their planning efforts. Um, so I think that this was seen as um, a key piece of that. One of the things that I didn't show, and I do have, I have a couple, if I can get them. I just hid them from presentation mode. One of the other pieces of the street tree inventory was looking at um, the, the overall tree canopy cover. Um, and that's a piece that, that Jackson um, at SRPC did the, the mapping for. Um, the overall 
sort of effort was to tease, like initially um, what, what they had hoped to do was to tease out whether there are differences in tree canopy cover in different areas of the city where there are um, <coughs> different uh, socioeconomic um, neighborhoods. Um, what, what we found was, and Jackson was able to use some uh, data from USDA to kind of create this canopy cover proxy based on um, vegetation. Um, that's what you can see in green here. Um, but w what we found was that, you know, the data at the census tract level is not fine enough to really tease out that information <laughs> at all. Um, so, so, and while I think that's an important part of this process, and that's actually a big piece of the project that I worked on in, in Boston quite a few years ago, was building up the tree canopy <laughs> in, in areas where there's not a lot of canopy and there's also lower income communities. Um, a different approach to gathering that data would definitely be necessary um, than looking at the census tract. You can see the, the gray lines uh, outline the census tract and the purple is the central business dis district there. And so I think there were two, maybe three different tracks um, in that small area, but uh, you just can't tease out the information there. We did. We did summarize it with a big caveat that, um, um, you know, it's, it's um, you're looking at a, rel a fairly large geographic area and trying to connect um, this proxy tree canopy cover data to it. So um, you have to, you have to take it with a grain of salt. Start from the ground up. Um, <laughs> well, um, we, at our last meeting, we were talking about the feasibility of uh, scale, you know, doing a scaled back project, um, you know, a sm relatively small area from what we were originally talking about and whether we could incrementally add to that after the fact. And if so, um, what would be the, you know, the financial and labor cost of doing that? Do you have any insight into that? Um, well, I, I can't. I can't give give you a cost. Yeah, right, right off not the top of my head. Um, exact I numbers. Definitely um, talk to SRPC and see, you know, if they would be interested in doing um, sort of the back end survey one two three piece again. That's probably not something I would invest. But, but I don't have. I have some GIS software, but I don't have that mm -hmm. capability um, myself. Um, I think um, I think you could definitely do pieces at a time and add to your data set. Um, I don't see why that wouldn't be possible from like a data management standpoint. Um, and I think it's honestly more realistic than trying to do a, a full area, you know, citywide um, assessment in one summer. Um, I think that one of the things that I would probably do differently is have um, maybe like a training day and then also have an event and try to get folks out on the same day um, and go out to different areas of the neighborhood and probably get cooperative extension or um, you know an arborist or forester involved in the process too um, and in the training and um, kind of um, of ramp up the community engagement piece a little bit um, by trying to do the inventory um, you know on, on a Saturday and Sunday maybe and then also let people do it on their own time too I think that would be a nice piece of it mm -hmm. um, I would definitely recommend survey one two three seem to work really well for it it's really really easy to use um, I might be able to pull up this dashboard that Jackson also created Um, with this is this is still available oh, well it is still available <laughs> um, it doesn't look like it's going to open up on um, browser but I might be able to open it um, that people can interact with and kind of explore the data without having a GIS license so that they can see um, you know trees look at a tree in their neighborhood 
look at what species it is, um, which is kind of an interesting feature. So in, in all those neighbor, um, in the neighborhoods or the streets that you all sampled, you knew for sure, I mean, you had a defined area that was private or um, public land versus private land. You didn't have to worry about, oh, that's somebody's, you know, um, somebody sampling a, uh, a tree in somebody's yard or on an edge of the property. Yeah, we said, um, we said look at the trees that are either in the, the tree belt or the verge yeah. um, between the sidewalk and the street or trees that are in the sidewalk if there wasn't any um, grass median yeah. there. Yeah, okay. Um, we didn't do parks. Right. Um, we just stuck with street trees. Yeah, and any, so, and there, and there could be, potentially could be city trees not in that media sort of concrete, not right. concrete, but pavement yeah. area. Yeah, so yeah we just, just really be... said just this is what a street tree is that we're, this is how we're defining yeah. a street tree. Yeah, this yeah. is the data we're collecting. Yeah. okay. Yeah. But there'd be, there'd be nothing stopping us from doing something like that, like with, at the schools, for example. Yeah, and there's nothing, I mean, yeah, there's there's no real problem with uh, sampling a, a private tree either, you know, and then figuring out that it's not, you know, by property right. lines or whatever. But no, I was just curious <laughs> of what the Asian approach privacy. would be to sort of filter that out without having that map first, you know. Yeah. Um, something I'm working on right now, Kevin, I've, I've, list, I've made a spreadsheet of the, of the streets and roads in Summersworth. Amber is giving me... Uh, the right of ways and what I've been doing for the past couple of weeks is going out measuring the pavement, <clears throat> excuse me, the paved, paved area so I can build it into the spreadsheet, you know, what the right of way is, what the paved area is. The difference is the right of way you know, divided by two and half on each side of the road. So, so Dover's project didn't get into right of way, rights of way, right? So strictly so, trees that are within the sidewalk itself or the between the sidewalk and the street or medians, right? Yeah. Yep. It's not going to be very many. Yeah, so one of the things I would recommend doing is thinking about who's going to who's going to use the information and how and kind of what specifics do you want? Like if there's different data than what's on that questionnaire um, or if there's things that aren't useful, um, what what's most useful to the Conservation Commission and the city and um, you know, who, who manages the street trees and what, what do they want to know? I think that, that part of the project in Dover needed to be strengthened a little bit to make it as useful as possible. I think like that, I mean, that's something that's been discussed here a number of times. You know, f for me, I see all these uses for those data, but then at the same time, you know, we don't have a city forester. If, uh, if somebody wanted, you know, uh, to know information like, you know, some of the maps you showed of replacement trees or damage or anything like that, you know, the the right person would have to find the other right person <laughs> in the in the city to to be able to um, go to that ArcGIS site and pull up those maps. You know what I mean? Like it's not. Ideally, you'd have, you know, like a central person that whatever other, you know, somebody public works or whatever had a question, they would just go to. And it sounds like that kind of tripped up Dover, too, maybe, where there wasn't a central point to distribute that information out. You know, you can make the maps, but you want this to be living, too, you know, and changing over time and adding to. So it's something... Um, I think that that's something we'd have to really work through. Like, you know, I think, Doug, you found out that we have, the city has an ESRI contract, um, so we should be able to house some of this ourselves if we had to. But, because I do, I mean, I, I, I feel like they're so useful, but I also can see this, like, bottleneck that would form, too, where, where people wouldn't know where to get the data from. Well, there's a, there's a public interface for the Dover project. Is that just a static snapshot? Um, so the Dover project, so the plan and then the appendices have like the, a, an Excel file with the data, um, the questionnaire, the instructions, um, I think the piece of 
kind of the regulations overview. And then this dashboard, I don't think that, I think Chrome is out of date, and so it's not opening. Um, I don't want to dig around this computer too much for another browser. But there is, and I can, I can send it out, there is a dashboard if folks are interested in looking at that that is public. Um, I don't know if, if SRPC is going to maintain it in or have it live indefinitely. Yeah. Um, that would be a question for them. But you can kind of zoom in on um, an interface that looks a lot like those maps and zoom in and out and click on different um, features and sort through um, some of the data. Like if you want to look at only the, the trees in poor condition, for example. So if, if community members or others are interested in looking at that, then you can certainly do that. And yeah, otherwise it's using um, an Excel table or using the um, the the GIS data, um, you know, or or thinking about other ways that you would want that information packaged at the end of a project too. Um, certainly, there could be other pieces of a plan that that outline in in sort of more detail what what the next steps are once you have all the information. I think what you're talking about, Scott, is I've seen that too, and it's essentially you click on, you, you zoom into a neighborhood, you click on that tree, and then all of these data um, points yeah, come up. I all, think you all can hover there. over. Yeah, I, I believe I sent that out to everyone. It's, it's basically the Dover's dashboard. The dashboard, okay. Yeah, so if, I mean, yeah, if we maintain, if we could on. maintain a dashboard through the city, then that solves that problem of that individual contact, so that's a good idea. Do you um do you remember like roughly how many volunteers you guys pulled together? I think I think sixteen. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. that's a lot. Yeah, yeah. Nature Groupie was helpful with with attracting some volunteers. I've heard of that yeah. before, so that's good to know. Yeah. And then you you said nobody went out for accuracy purposes or anything. It was just what came in was what you went with for the most um, part. Yeah, I mean, uh, we looked at a few um, photos hmm. that came in. Um, I went out and did some of the surveys and checked on a couple things, um, but we didn't have like an arborist out there. Yeah. Were you involved with um, any plan for maintaining the data after the fact? No, um, and that, that would be a question for SRPC as far as the dashboard, um, because that's, it's still live, um, but I believe it's, you know, that's a good question. It, it may be hosted by Dover now, not by SRPC. Mm -hmm. um, so no, we passed over all of the data to, um, to the city of Dover after the, that completion. Um, if it's something that um, I personally probably wouldn't get involved in, but SRPC might um, mm -hmm. maintain something if there was a need for that. Doug, is that something you'd wanna follow up on? Just uh, actually, I talked to Jackson uh, about that, and he was saying that once, once the database is built and populated, uh, as uh, Liz said, it's turned over to the city. Mm -hmm. They can update it for the city, but at a cost. Like, if yeah. you wanted to do it in segments, they'd probably charge you each time they updated the database. Yeah. Um, but um, the city may or may not have a plan to maintain it regularly in the future. Uh, you know, otherwise the, the data will just sit there and rot. Right. I, I'm not sure what Dover is, if they're updating it themselves. Or I think if we were to if we were to do this, then we would want to hammer that out. Somebody, and ideally, it wouldn't be us. Yeah, I mean, I think if Dover's Dover, I think if they're updating and maintaining the database, they're probably updating. They're probably not updating the dashboard. Um, if they surveyed new areas, they might update that dashboard. They're if they are, you know checking off like we replanted re a tree in that empty pit then they maybe may be using the gis database for that they may just be using a spreadsheet i'm not mm -hmm. question that um you know i could we could connect with um with dover to see how they're using it yeah 
Um, I know we did a follow-up presentation at a Coastal Adaptation Workgroup meeting and asked that question, and um, I, I don't know how much they were using it. So I, that's why I think it is really important to think about what sort of what the end use of yeah. something like this is and how little or how much information do you want on the trees. If you were uh, starting a survey in Summersworth, and you know we have um, some cemetery parks areas like that, and then you know different streets that have a lot of trees, what would what would be your priority? Do you think just to get people kind of trained up, you know, and going? Is it easier to just go into a block of forest that we know is city property um, or public property, or is it? Because I can kind of argue either way or see either way that you go into a block, but then there's more trees and a lot of stuff to keep track of versus going down a street that either um, Doug is buffered on each side or we have some or we work with something else like what the constraints that Dover used. I mean, if you're if you're just trying to train people to identify a species, then maybe a forest. But if you're if you're trying to train people to do like the street tree inventory piece, like the actual identifying the species is kind of a relatively minor piece of sure. the survey. So I would do it, you know, in a site where there are enough trees around that you could go and show examples mm -hmm. of this is, you know, this is what we're talking about here. This is how you actually physically measure it. Um, Example, a mix of examples of different types of damage and, and disease and yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm partially I'm wondering just how effective it is for a forest because you know you have you're relying on your phone's GPS too and and so if you're in a you know if you're in a park doing individual you know if there's a hundred trees are you going to be able to really link back to unless unless there's a lot of diversity in the tree species that you're going to have a hard time tracking back to what tree you mapped mm, yeah you know, so hmm. yeah and I think there probably are better programs than the than the uh, Survey one two three app for for that kind of like more intensive tree identification yeah, and yeah, yeah. geolocating process. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you. you coming and really helpful. Yeah, please be able to follow, follow up if you have questions or if you want me to make connections with any of the other staff that worked on on the project. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All right, Doug, you got to get going. <coughs> got to get going. Well, I'm, I'm already going, but now it looks like I got to back up. Okay, is there any other new business? Sorry? Any other new business? Nothing for me. Okay. Old business. Item A, easement monitoring. I have no updates on that. Any correspondence regarding old business? Let's cross it, no? Member items, subcommittee items, and reports. Wildlife management plan for the Lily Pond parcel. That's me, and I don't have an update on that. Um, although there is a, um, a report due for, for uh, DES, and um, Mr. Collins and uh, Ms. Smith Kenyon have volunteered to to walk the site with uh, with DES and fill out those forms. So thank you very much for that. Um, that's an annual um, stipulation for the for the grant that we got. Invasive plan subcommittee report. Well, you got some information from. Thanks, Jody. I did get um, a bunch of information from the conference this past weekend. Um, 
about invasives and controlling invasives and also a really helpful list of things to pl not plant um, when you're working on um, a project that comes from New Hampshire Comprehensive Invasive Plant List from the New Hampshire Department of Agriculture um, and Environmental Services and it goes from th things that are absolutely prohibited to things that you have to watch for because um, they have the potential um, they do have some invasive characteristics that over time could allow them to spread rapidly and become in invasive and then there's also a early detection rapid response species because they show some inv invasive tendencies um, and are likely to soon arrive or already occur in New Hampshire but not are f not fully establi established um, <clears throat> and we have things on there like um, Velvet Leaf Indian Mallow, which is on the watch list. Uh, we also have, of course, um, <coughs> Norway Maple is prohibited. Um, garlic Mustard is prohibited. Um, and then there's a lot of things, and of course our Oriental Bittersweet is prohibited. Um, burning Bush, which a lot of people have and don't realize is prohibited. Um, but when you do remove something one of the things when you remove something, you have to know how it reproduces so that you make sure that you <coughs> take care of it in a manner that it's not going to cause more problems. And you move from a less impacted area to a more impacted area so that you don't contaminate stuff that's not as badly already contaminated. Um, so there was a lot of good information um, and a lot of disposal. You can't just put it in your wheelbarrow and then dump it somewhere. A lot of it you have to either put it in a, um, a black garbage bag and make sure that it gets heated up <coughs> by the sun or you can burn them um, and you just have to be super careful. <coughs> and so animals might not necessarily be a good, I know at some points people have mentioned about using goats, but depending on where the plant is in its life cycle that could actually spread things because if you have a bunch of goats that are eating bittersweet that already have their seed pods on there the next time they go somewhere they're going to spread some more um, so those are all the kinds of things that you have to look at <coughs> so it was very helpful um, i finished the invasives section of the preserve summer's work plan so mm -hmm. we'll tie in you know, whatever comes out of the subcommittee with that. Oh, okay. A lot of it came from um, Cooperative Extension as well. All right, thank you. Okay, exploration of formal conservation of Mallee Farm City Parcel. <coughs> That's uh, Mr. Dodds and myself. Yeah. Uh, still on hold i sent another email to uh southeast land trust contact i think i'd probably given them about a month or so i know he's swamped so i sent that email maybe monday uh, i can't remember sunday or monday of this this week so i'll probably follow up with him next week wait until maybe midweek but then i think at that point you know maybe we revisit the other pathway to a more solid conservation um, if we don't hear anything back from them did you want the contact for the land law sure yeah i mean if you want to pass that on and maybe i'll even start that now anyways because okay. this has been um yeah we're, we've been a little bit delayed from where I, where I would have hoped to have been um yeah so send me that i'll reach out to him i'll follow up with Celt and see the Celt southeast land trust it just it makes so much sense i think you know if we can pull it off but it, it may also just not be their priority so um other things related to that you know i'd, I'd been gone for almost a month but uh, i did start to prioritize um so our contractors gave us a report that i sent out to everybody there was a spreadsheet with individual tasks and i started to look at that and kind of prioritize it but then also I'm sorry, this is regarding the trail. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I switched topics. Well, it's not really <laughs> switching topics, but uh, that trail report uh, has been sent around. But that I think 
so the, the, the sort of the tasks that need to be done to improve the, the trails there, I want to prioritize those, look at the cost of them, and then see what we can do volunteer-wise too, you know, and not just rely on, I mean, there's going to be some things that we're going to need help for on bridges and stuff like that, but, um, and then I guess, you know, come up with a plan that we can all discuss about, like, going forward and, and trying to get a move on there, so, uh, and whether we want to keep working with that company that we contracted or go at, you know, our own or with somebody else, so. So maybe by, I, I would hope that, you know, by the next meeting, we'd have a good sense of if how we'll go forward with conservation and then, you know, what some of the, the steps we can take for the, I mean, I hate going forward on trail stuff without first having the site locked in a little bit better, but we might be able to do some stuff um, while we wait, so. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. Thank you. Okay, yep. Any other old business? Are you sure? Um, we had that, unless you have anything to add from the tree list that um, Shane, we had provided from the code compliance officer, if anybody had comments on that or if that's I haven't something. Read it yet. Okay, for next month. Anyone else? I will. Uh, our Do you need a copy, Shane? Um, Sean, sorry, I'm getting mixed up. I will provide that for you. All right, our treasurer is um, not here, so unless uh, Ms. Crosley has the report, then I guess we can skip it. I do not, sorry. All right. Any other items that anybody wanted to bring up? Clarification based on what we saw tonight, what we were just talking about. I guess my understanding of this tree survey was anything within the right-of-way, the city's right-of-way. And now it sounds like that's different. Well... That's what Dover did. I mean, it's not. it doesn't mean that that's what we have to do. Right. I think Dover did it for simplicity's sake, for the volunteers mostly. I mean, is that what you got out of it? Yeah, I, I like your approach right now, you know, and, and there may be, the, you know, to, to buffer the, each street, and that's, that's your footprint for a survey, you know. I, you know, because Dover, you know, Dover downtown is a little bit different than our downtown too, so. Right. Um, I bet you find that the city doesn't have that many trees in, you know, in the right of way anyway. As a lot of the streets, no, um, what I've seen when I've been out there, a lot of the streets no, but there are streets where you have the paved area, the curb, and then you have a eight or ten, eight or nine foot section. Then they have built a property, a wall, and I, I based on. What I'm doing, I'm getting the pavement, the, the length of the pavement, and then Amber's providing with the right-of-way, so then I can figure it out. But I would assume anything up to that wall is city property. And there are trees in there. Yeah. I guess regardless of landmarks or whatever, we just have to go with the... Yeah, I just, uh, in order to, to start it and, uh, you know, get prepared for, like, springtime, I need to know what it is we're going to be looking at. Yeah. Um, well, we we can decide on that right now. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, what would you be most comfortable with? You've been out looking at these things, so. Well, like I say, I I get a thing in my head, and I, it's usually what I go with. But um, if we're looking at city trees and we don't designate something a tree as one of ours, something happens to it. The landowner says, you know, I want this fixed, and we're saying, well, it's not in our list. You know. Well. We're the tree board, right? And um, that's what we, we, we're supposed to field questions or concerns about that sort of thing, Tr trees in the right sort of way that right. um, people are worried about. So people can always come to us about those, regardless of whether the tree's on a, a survey or not. Yeah, I would rather, personally, I'd rather have more information than less. Yeah. Um, you know, something <laughs> like the, what I was just alluding to is, you know, somebody comes out and hits the, hits the tree and they call DPW to go out and cut it or whatever and possibly replace it at some point. You know, at least we have a record now of what it is, how big it is, you know, what type yep. it is. Okay. I mean, that's just my take on it. Um. 
I don't think we need to vote on that, but I support it. I think if that's the direction you're going, unless anybody has any concerns about it, that works. Thanks for doing all the, yep. the legwork. The only other, the only other thing I had was, um, I guess what we were talking about it earlier is, uh, are we going to piecemeal it? And if so, where do we start? I mean, I can do this. It doesn't matter. But at some point, we're going to have to decide, are we going to do all the streets at once, half of the city, you know, how we're going to start it. I do like the idea of a training type uh, <coughs> facility, but a uh, meeting. Oh, Field day. Yeah. But I could see that being done, say, in a park. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where I mean, not in um, like Willen Pond Forest or whatever, but a park where you can actually have a number of people and yeah, familiar familiarize people with the exactly. apps or, or you know forms or whatever. <coughs> that was one of the things I forgot to ask Liz was the app she's alluding to the uh, Survey One Two Three, the downloadable app. Is that something we can get our hands on? Is it a proprietary? Well, she said it's, we can download it. It's free. <laughs> yeah, the just need to the tie in with that or where Esri as the company gets you, like you can you, you can download the app for free, but the data you have to have a license to access the data, right? It's getting from it's going from the app into the Esri cloud. <laughs> the client and that's free. where so like summers where if the city has an Esri account, um, we would want to get with them and see about setting up that interface with the so the GIS person with the city would set up a um, set up a project and then tie in with the survey one two three so you know potentially depending on you know what the skill set we have in the city is we may not need to go out for anything you know we have we you know we can. We, we can recreate the da the data sheet, you know, and and change it to however we want. Have it run through the city, and the data goes right into the city's GIS. So, it just really depends on what type of resources we have here. But yeah, that's where they get you. I mean, the app's free, but yeah. you can't yeah you can't get the data. Do, do you have any idea what the cost for the, for the license is? I do not, but as re, I mean, they're it's very expensive. I know that you City know, um, yeah, okay. yeah. It would cost a lot. That I would imagine like tens of thousands of dollars, probably. But because <laughs> then you know you have it, you know, survey one two three brings the data. You bring the data in to the you know to the Esri to the interface. And then I think, I mean, I don't have these skills, but it's pretty easy to then for somebody who is GIS, more GIS savvy, to make that interface that you were talking about, Scott, that you've seen. Like, that's just, that's just the outward facing view of the data, you know, and it just takes somebody to, to create that page, really. So, I mean, I can demo all of this for us if we want with my projects you know I use that through the forest service but if you know if we wanted to meet or something and just run through how all of this looks we can do that too you're the boss you, you run the subcommittee so <laughs> you're free to um, recruit people to do stuff and steer it All right, does anybody have a motion? For adjournment. I make a motion to adjourn. There's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting is adjourned at 721. Thank you.